Thank you, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon. I hope your day was good so far, and the second day will be even, even better. So today we'll talk about performance marketing. We go through some best practices. Uh, we go really deep, uh, as, as you heard, with some hands-on examples on like, how we faced uh, 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 challenges and how we try to solve them, um, basically with some good examples on how we try to achieve growth and how performance marketing can be a growth, uh, growth lever. So I'm Joost. I'm from the Netherlands originally. Uh, good to be here next to the, the, the stand. Um, previously, um, I was uh, at Treatwell, building the team from the ground up. Um, I have an engineering background. Uh, that is also where my performance marketing uh, inspiration comes from. And uh, currently, I'm at Colvin, Barcelona-based company, as you heard. And we are redefining the Flory culture uh, industry by connecting all the different stakeholders in a new digital ecosystem. So retailers, growers, uh, and wholesalers. Let's talk about performance marketing. So let's start with your challenge. Yeah. The first thing is, what is your challenge? Then we'll talk a bit about the roadmap, and then we talk about what does good look like. But let's start about your challenge. What is your challenge? Let me guess. What is on the top list of your challenge? It's probably, how do we grow? How do you grow fast? Your product team, if you have a product team, might be talking about how do we think about delivering customer value, but what keeps you awake is probably growth. How do we grow faster? Uh, and we cannot grow fast enough. How do we grow week on week? How do we grow year on year? And these are very important topics. Um, and if you want to speed up, performance marketing can help you with that. Um, but it's not a holy grail, it's not a silver bullet. So today, we're going to look at how can you apply performance marketing in your journey. So let's take a step back. Yeah, when we talk about performance marketing, and I think historically it has a really broad meaning, uh, but let's zoom in what performance marketing means, and also if it's right for you. Because initially, if you want to grow, you need to understand what your growth model is. And there are several models that you can apply. And usually, a company, or there's early stage, uh, that can happen naturally, so you found your growth channel. It can be word of mouth, it can be referral friend, referral models. Uh, it can be expansion if you're a marketplace, for example, uh, that relies on supply. Uh, you really need uh, to build both sides of the marketplace. So expansion is a, is a big lever and can be one of your growth models. Um, again, SEO can be one of your growth models, one of your organic, organic growth strategies, um, et cetera. And there are very, very many growth models you can apply, and performance marketing is one of them. And how I define performance marketing here, uh, it is basically paid growth or ads. In some companies and in some areas, uh, it has a broader meaning. You could also say, OK, SEO is, is, is growth. Lifecycle or CRM, CRM is performance marketing. But let's uh, keep, stick to the, to the definition of, OK, paid growth, that is performance marketing. And usually, uh, you would pick one or two that you really want to develop uh, from your, from within your business. And performance marketing can be one of those. Um, but before you scale, you really need to understand what are some of these models you, you can apply. Just an example. Yeah, you might have seen this or might have heard it that Airbnb, uh, well, they IPO'd, pre IPO, pre COVID. Um, yeah, they really wanted to ramp up their, their, their booking numbers. And they invested billions extra in their performance marketing. And what does it say? I think there are a few articles you can find, it, find about it. Um, it was visible in the uh, IPO documents, but Airbnb fell flat last year on the marketing plan inspired by Booking.com. So you really need to understand what is your growth model and just copying it uh, without having the foundation, how big you are, uh, does not work. So if you found or if you think that performance marketing can be one of the growth levers for your business. Uh, first step is, is zooming out. How do you actually plan your journey? What do you need to think about? So I'm going to explain you a few principles that I think of and uh, that might help you to get to this journey. And the overall journey uh, starts with, it's more of a marketing challenge, I think, and growth challenge, and we're getting better at this. But how do you make sure that your marketing team, your performance marketing team, moves away from being a cost center uh, into a revenue driver that is really, really measurable. 
so you become our true business partner. Let's give, get some examples. So if you have a performance marketing team, the first thing you need to think about is be at the forefront of the month. That team, your experts, they need to know what is happening. What are people searching for? Uh, how are campaigns performing? What is currently trending? They are very close to the data. And I'm giving you some examples later on of how does that impact your, your business. But the performance team is really at the forefront of the month. Uh, they have all the data, so use it. The next one is using the right metrics. And we're using the right metrics and KPI. So some of you might have heard of uh, Goodhart's law, which says when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. And with targets, you can change it to KPI. There are a few good examples uh, on that. But this is just one I found, is if you measure people on the number of nails made, what the team will do or what the people naturally will do, they will create thousands of nails uh, that might not be of good quality. On the other side, if you add a KPI or a metric, which says, OK, uh, we measure you on the weight of nails. What they will do is probably uh, create a few giant nails. So understanding the difference between a metric and a KPI is really important when you want to start measuring uh, performance marketing. Just another example uh, of, of real life. Uh, I, I, I moved countries and had to open a bank account. And I've seen this a couple of times also at airports. And after we opened the bank account, the employee, he clearly had on the bottom of his screen a nice uh, printout where it said uh, a green smiley, which is a 10, uh, and then the 8, 9, uh, and below was a red smiley. Uh, why this happened? It is probably he's measured on NPS. So he was clearly asking me, say, if you think I'm going to do job, 10 is good. The rest, please don't rate me because that will hurt my hurt my metrics. So if the NPS, for example, becomes a focus area, people will definitely move, uh, try to game the system. Again, for Machine learning, really important for performance marketing. Uh, we are living in a world where automation is important. So the team can just put a metric in, uh, whether it's app installs or, or CUC, and the system will optimize. The system will optimize without knowing your business. So the team needs to become an operator of that system. So if you want to have app installs, for example, please understand and together sit down with the team if that is the right metric. Otherwise, the team will optimize specifically for getting app installs, which might not be relevant because the current system and ecosystem, they don't know your business. If you're Google, if you're Facebook, you need to be operating. You need to understand what the team is, is building or what the team is doing. Then how do you set right metrics? So I'm guiding you to different metrics we can use um, from Leading metrics. So a leading metric is something that will set you up for success, but does not really tell you uh, uh, an output. So ideally, it starts with profit and revenue contribution. If you do performance marketing, you really want to understand the output of uh, your campaigns. Uh, and in the end, it, is, it should start with profit. Right? So if you have a team that is talking about conversions or is talking about CTRs, try to make sure that everybody's focused on one metric, which is, which is profit. Because in the end, the marketing investment you do and the marketing investment you make, uh, it costs money. And in the end, you want to understand what the ROI is of, this, uh, of these campaigns. So start with profit. Um, the second one, you have efficiency metrics. So aside from uh, leading metrics, efficiency metrics tell you, tells you something about the quality. For example, going back to the nails example, uh, to put a quality metric in place really helps you to understand the absolute numbers, the volumes, but also measuring the quality. Then you have list metrics. So how much do you spend in marketing and how incremental is it? It's really important to understand and to not focus on averages, but how much incremental value can you deliver? And then, of course, you have the lagging metrics, which are more closely related to the output you want to generate, but they don't tell you why or how. Just to put down some metrics here that might be relevant. Uh, for subscription or DTC uh, models, you might be looking at several metrics. Some of these could be your KPI. It doesn't mean that these are all of your KPIs, but you could look at conversion lift. So for example, if you run campaigns, uh, 
what do people do and how do they behave if, you, if they haven't seen these campaigns? So how incremental is your marketing investment? For apps, uh, obviously app installs is a good, probably leading metric of how successful your app is, how much revenue you will generate. Um, I think investors still look at app installs. Why? Because it might be a proxy of your future profit or your market share compa compared to pet competitors. Yeah. It's not something you would optimize for, but it's still uh, an important uh, leading metric that can lead to, to revenue in the future. Cost per installs, of course, you want to look at efficiency, like, okay, what is the cost you pay per install? Uh, and if you have an app, an e-commerce app or a gaming app, you want to look at activation rates. So how many people that actually downloaded your app uh, are actually doing an action within one or seven days? It could be making a booking, it could be uh, uh, generating uh, an in-app in -app purchase. And then paid cock. We go. Uh, we will talk about it uh, later on, but paid cock is really important. Uh, the difference between blended and, uh, and paid cock. And obviously, the ultimate metric is cock LTV. So what is the ratio of actually the, the, the customers you acquired and how much you paid for it uh, and the revenue and profit they, they generate? And I think most of the investors, they want to know what is your cock LTV. Uh, it is, there are multiple definitions of what do you include in CUC with discounts or without discounts. Uh, but it is a good proxy of uh, having a good metric on how efficient is your marketing uh, investment. For B2B and SaaS, you might be looking at uh, cost per leads. Obviously, then the sales team uh, will come back to you and say, OK, but these leads are not converting. So hey, you might align with your sales team around what, how do we define a qualified lead? What is a qualified lead? Uh, Pipeline contribution, how much does marketing contribute to your, to your pipeline? Um, and then, uh, obviously, of course, also for SaaS, CAC LTV on a, on a more like generic, uh, generic level. The next one, facilitating transparency with your uh, uh, CFO. Really important. Uh, I think uh, what set us up for success is that we, with the marketing team, had an ongoing relationship and check-in with the, with the finance, finance team. So we build a rolling forecast. We constantly are monitoring CACs. We constantly uh, kept the finance team up to date around our upper funnel investments, because that directly uh, 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 has an impact on, on, on the CACs. So building a good, solid, ongoing uh, communication stream with your finance team is, I think, key for uh, setting up your performance marketing team for, for success. They need to know what is going on. They need to be able to access the data. And currently, with all the BI tools, you can give them that data. You can really uh, engage with them. Uh, and for me, that is the most important part. Just share everything you have at a very detailed level with your finance partner, with your CFO. You have nothing to hide. Uh, it's your data. Uh, and everybody should be looking at uh, how you're performing at a daily level. Engage with them. Just an example on how we did it uh, uh, at Treatwell. Uh, we were managing uh, budgets together with the finance team. At the beginning of the year, they come up with a finance model. We had a city-based strategy. Uh, the finance team allocated a certain, certain level of investment by city based on the projected growth. But actually, this is linking back to be at the forefront of demand uh, and expansion. But what we were seeing is that the team was more busy with managing budgets. And, and stakeholders of like, are we going to spend, uh, understand or overspend this the rest of the uh, the rest of the month, and not driving company performance. So what we did, we sat down with the finance team, we redefined the financial plan, and what we really saw is that we built a model where the performance team actually uh, would come up with suggestions of where could we find the most incremental growth, where could we find the the, the, the next uh, uh, customer at the cheapest price, so the cost per incremental order. So it's really important that you work together with the finance team to redefining, like, where do you think the growth opportunities are? And in the end, we ended up with a central budget allocation, uh, which helped us to uh, grow faster. More on that uh, an example later. And then breaking down channels. So obviously, you have your PPC campaigns, you have your bottom of the funnel campaigns. They're really good, especially, uh, I think, when everybody's online, it's COVID, you turn on PPC, uh, you capture all the demand that's there, uh, but it doesn't scale. Right? You cannot just scale paid search. And uh, that is one important topic. You need to build a full funnel strategy. So you need to 
think about your current demand. Uh, your current demand, you can obviously, with paid search, with retargeting, you can capture that demand. But at the same time, and convince your CFO, convince your finance team, you need to invest in future demand. Driving up front campaigns, invest in YouTube display, work with influencers. You need to work on both legs, and it's really important uh, that both work together, uh, and that drives future success. The next one, uh, we've talked about it, but uh, data. So build a modern data stack. There are too many companies that have onboarded different systems, whether you're a B2B company, you need, you need, you need a lead generation tool, you need an engagement tool, you need an outreach tool. Uh, but actually, then uh, after, after a few weeks or months, like, what do we do with all the data? How do we connect it? And there are a few steps and a few elements that a, a, a modern data stack consists of which is the first one is all your data sources. So you want to have all your data sources, offline conversions, spent data uh, in one place. You will want to collect it. You want to store it in probably your cloud data warehouse. Uh, and then you want to apply intelligence on that. So you want to transform it. You want to connect it, visualize it to the business, visualize it to the finance team. So they are on a daily basis, you understand what is happening. And the Technologies out there currently are quite easy. You don't need a data, big data, data team anymore to implement all the different data sources. Right? Tools like Stitch or Fivetran can easily pull in all the data from Salesforce, from Google Ads, your ad spend at a daily level. And then, of course, you need to visualize that. However, you also need to, to send that data back to your, to your systems. If you know the lifetime value of a customer, you want to have that visible in the customer service team and Salesforce. So, by applying these principles, you will build a modern data stack which sets you up for a success. An example of like how, how you can leverage that, uh, just a hands-on example, which is the budget allocation we did. Uh, again, at Retail, we had a budget constraint. We had, with the finance team, beginning of the year, we set up specific budgets for specific cities, and we really were seeing that we, are, we, could, we were missing out on opportunities to grow faster. So what we did is we took away all these uh, constraints, we build a spend curve together with a data team uh, and a marketing team of like how much can we spend per week and how much new customers do we expect. That then is applied, was applied automatically on a weekly basis to all the different markets. So we moved from a financial forecast on a spreadsheet towards a demand-driven model that was allocating budget on where can we find uh, incremental demand. Uh, at uh, the cheapest way. And, and initially, we, we looked at the cost per order, and then that moved more towards a revenue and lifetime approach. This saved us, in six months, 2 million euros, without any, lo lose, lo without any uh, 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 lost customers. So at the same order level, we saved 2 million euros by applying this data-driven budget allocation model. The next one is defining your operating system. So probably you will start with a local structure. Uh, that's what we saw at, uh, uh, from my experience. Is that there are many companies that go from centralization, decentralization, localization, centralization. But in the end, I'm a high believer in building functional expertise on the right side. Why? Because it gives your team the opportunity to learn, to grow in their careers. They don't have to. Uh, squats might change on a quarterly basis, but building deep functional expertise within performance marketing is the key to, key to success. Again, it might not be applied to your specific situation, but from my experience, deep functional expertise is really important to make sure your performance marketing team is set up for success. Creative excellence. Yeah, we had a session about brands. You cannot go without brands anymore. So on the left side, uh, you will see masterclass, really high production value, high production content. Uh, good example of how to engage with your, with your audience on Instagram and Facebook. On the right side, you have Textile. It's a, it's a, it's a US company, and they are a subscri subscription service. And they really iterate with almost like crappy ads. You need to find out what's working for you. You need to find out what is working for you. Test different ads, test different creatives, run, create a feedback loop with your creative team. But as you can see, uh, you will probably uh, push brands to the limits. And then the creator economy. So performance marketing at Colvin, where I'm currently at, uh, sits 
with performance marketing. The influencer team sits with performance marketing. We do brand influencers, but it's the second biggest channel. All those micro-influencers, you need to engage with them. And there are currently platforms where you can engage directly with your creators. I think in most of the European markets now, the creator marketplace is launched from TikTok. Uh, great opportunity to connect directly with some of your potential creators that can promote your product. OK, what does good look like? If we know some of these principles, how do you apply them to the business? And where should you start? What is, what sh where should you start with building the foundation? We've touched upon it uh, very briefly in, for example, how to build a data stack. But I want to give you a bit of a roadmap of what does good look like and what is best in class. OK, measurement, creative KPIs, data and automation. How do we set the foundation and what is next level? So when you talk about measurement, uh, let's start with a single source of truth. Let's start with Google Analytics. Last click is OK. It is perfect. You need to set the baseline. Last click is better than, uh, better than nothing. If you understand that last click and you understand what the limitations are, continue to use it. It's a good baseline. Creative. As I said, brand and creative are really important. Make sure you have a creative team in-house or facilitate quick iterations. You can work with an agency, but uh, don't make it a waterfall model. You need to build those feedback loops. What are some of the good KPIs as a foundation? Obviously, your customer, uh, customer acquisition costs are important. And way too often, I see people talking about blended cock. Even in investor decks, uh, please try to split it out between paid cock and blended cock. Why? Uh, if your campaigns are not profitable, that's OK. But if tomorrow someone asks you to scale those campaigns, what will happen? Your contribution and, and, and the profit will plummet. So it's really important you understand the profitability of your marketing campaigns at a paid cock level, and ideally at an LTV level, and ideally at a segment level, but start with paid cock. That's the only way you can understand you make your campaigns scalable. Otherwise, if you scale, you'll be, of course, burning more money if you only look at blended cock models. Data and automation. OK, make sure you, it's very ambitious to have this here at the foundation. Um, there's a company here called Supermetrics. Amazing, does the job. It automates a lot of spreadsheets. Uh, this is an ambitious North Star. But have a look at it. And they're very uh, uh, good automation tools that can pull data also in a spreadsheet. It's wonderful. Uh, targeting, uh, important. Start with uh, easy targeting, uh, just on, on age. What is your customer? Uh, and then culture, OK, fall, fail fast and, uh, and, and cheap. If you want to take it to the next level, um, yeah, there are some steps in the middle. Uh, on the measurement side, you will probably want to have an in-house attribution model. Uh, you want to implement lift testing. But what do you, want to, do you need to do to take it to the next level? What is best in class? And for every company, that means probably something different. But best in class is on the measurement side, last click goes away, attribution goes away. Attribution doesn't exist anymore. So you need to combine your different data points, different, different resources. You need to probably look at your brand tracker. You need to look at, yes, your attribution model. You need to look at surveys, like how did people find out about you? Ask it in a checkout. Ask it wherever you can. How do you understand the incrementality of your marketing spend? Be brave. Turn off paid marketing for two weeks. Turn it off. See what happens. Turn off Facebook. Turn off paid search. Be brave and try to measure the incrementality. Creative. Ideally, in a best-in-class environment, you will have dynamic and personalized creatives. But it's really about generating that feedback loop, which is really important. In KPIs, uh, again, we talked about it. If you have COC, it's really good COC. But if you're an e-commerce business, COC doesn't differentiate between whether a user buys something for two, 2 euros or pounds or 200 euros or pounds. So you need to understand what the revenue is that this user generates. And then uh, data and automation. So a data warehouse is great, but what do you do with the data? Initially, you also want to create a feedback loop and send it back to Salesforce, send it back to your CX team. So best in class is having the data collected, connecting it, and then in an ideal case, uh, send it back to the systems so they can make better decisions. So these are some steps.
that you can take to uh, build a best-in-class roadmap uh, on several areas. We did it at scale at Trito. Again, just an example. Uh, we were in 13 markets, spending tens of millions in, 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 uh, in, in, in performance marketing. Uh, and we had something that changed really quickly. We had partners onboarding, partners offboarding, uh, salons in this case. And there was a team that they did everything manually in spreadsheets. So we built a tool that connects our paid search campaigns with the data warehouse. So including translations. So we had a huge translation database. Uh, and this was really the start of our automation journey. So make sure you think long term and build things in a scalable way. There are lots of things you can automate in, uh, in paid search and across all the different uh, channels, uh, together with your data team and together with some of the teams. How to get there? So performance marketing is about automation. We talked about creative, but if you want to scale, you need to think about how do you want to set up your team. So by seeing success of uh, the automation we drove uh, from the data warehouse with automating that paid search campaign creation, uh, we were able to scale the team, scale our campaigns without adding people, but without adding people in the performance team. We did add people in the automation team. So we really thought about, and this was years ago, I think many companies now have a marketing technology team, but we really opted for these three areas. So performance operations, daily campaign management, and then marketing technology and marketing analytics. These were the three pillars of the team where marketing technology really drove the roadmap. How can we automate? How can we build things at scale? And then obviously, you need to create a feedback loop with the brand team. What is creative success? How do we measure our creatives? How do we build our naming conventions in our Facebook campaign so you can actually drill down like the differentiates between a, name, an, 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 a review video, an unboxing video, et cetera? An example work chart of like how it can look like together. Uh, so, hey, your performance marketing vertical, or some companies it's a growth marketing vertical, depending on I think the sector you're in. Uh, there's quite an overlap. You have a retention vertical, and then you'll have uh, a brand vertical. But performance marketing can't live on its own. Uh, you need a product team, you need the brand team, and you need an engineering team. So the key is, yes, you need the finance team, but this is what creates success. Performance marketing cannot live on its own, and you need the entire organization to build success. So again, the basics, get the basics right, be in a driver's seat, find where there is demand, and then it's all about data, 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 and automation. There's a lot of things you can automate, and think about it. Invest in a marketing technology team. Invest in marketing technologists. They will help your performance marketing, but they will also help to connect the dots. They help your CRM and lifecycle team. And then pursue creative excellence. And again, performance marketing is at the heart of the business. Yeah, it's a data-driven, it should be the data-driven area of, uh, of the business. So I hope that you have these takeaways and that will help you to get it started. And uh, I really want to thank you uh, for the talk and uh, enjoy the rest of uh, Slush. Thank you very much.